Yeah, well, thank you very much, Lance. Uh, this is Jonathan Homer, and joining me in the call today is uh, Scott Wilkinson, Lead Analyst from Signal AI. And today we're going to uh, be covering uh, about moving to the uh, 400G highway. Uh, we're going to break this uh, discussion into two parts. Uh, Scott will lead the discussion, and he'll be talking a little bit about the need for uh, why we need 400G, uh, the mission to transport uh, current 100 gigabit Ethernet and future 400 gigabit Ethernet traffic. And he will go into some of the uh, aspects and some of the toolkits in terms of the various ways that we can piece together solutions uh, for this mission. Uh, I will then take over and focus a bit more specifically into one of the technologies, uh, specifically the CFP2 DCO pluggable and how this can be used to implement 400G ZR Plus in what we consider an innovative manner uh, and also provide a future-proof future evolution path uh, in terms of spectrum usage. Uh, and then we'll get into a dialogue, question and answers, and hope to make this a more interactive session with the audience. So with this, I will hand over to Scott. Uh, I'll be advancing the slides, so Scott, uh, just let me know whenever you need me to go from one to the next. Great. Thanks, Jonathan. Um, so this is basically what we're going to talk about today. Um, <clears throat> what's happening with, with the transition from 100 to 400, what's happening with coherent optics, and what the network designs are going to look like. Let's move on and actually talk about the content here. Next slide. Um, so the transition to 400 gig E is happening. Um, I, if you were, have followed what Cisco, Cisco had their, their announcement yesterday, their quarterly announcement, and they were asked about 400 gig E. Uh, the response from the CEO is it's early days, and that's certainly true. But the standards are established. There's lots of products out there. There are product numbers. There are product prices. Initial deployments have started. Uh, looks like the first customers were really going to be the cloud operators, and they're tying 400 gig E a lot to what happens on the transport side. So they can take 400 gig E and, and take it out into the network. And that's why I have this slide here. This is a Microsoft Azure slide. This is their roadmap for 400 ZR, which is going to take 400 gig E and be able to transport it across networks. And you can see they're, they're talking about doing pilots this year and roll out at the end of the year. Uh, the interesting thing about the cloud guys, of course, is they don't want to buy 20 or even 200 or even 2,000 um, 400 gig E's. They want to buy 2 million of them. They want to buy them in huge quantities right up front. So they're waiting for the supply chain to catch up. Um, and so this is, going to catch, this is going to take off relatively slowly and then just be a massive growth uh, later in the year. On the next slide. Takes a second to get there. Um, this is the coherent technology that I talked about. This is the roadmap for coherent technology. If you look at what we've been doing with coherent technology over the years, essentially since the beginning, since 100 gig coherent came out, most of the development and most of the focus has been on improving the performance, moving up that chain from uh, 10, gig, 10 gig with 30 gigabaud up to 40 gigabaud and 200 gig up to 60 gigabaud and 400 and 600 gig and moving forward into 800 gig and 1.2 terabit and all the things beyond that. That's really been the primary focus of development is moving up that, improving that performance. Recently, there's been a break and there's been a sort of a split and there's a huge amount of research going into how do we make it reduced in size and reduced in power for things like pluggable. And that's where things, the 400 ZRs and the ZR pluses come on. So for the first time, there's significant effort being split, split among these two branches. And you're seeing both of them sort of come out at the same time. Uh, 2020, the numbers on there were a little aggressive. It's really going to be more like 21 before they really start coming out, but both of those are in there. Uh, and that's um, that's what's really happening. And, and if you look at what's happening with those two, although the numbers are a little bit different, they're really all, again, focused on, on what's happening with 400 gig. On the next slide, I go into a little bit more detail about these, uh, these different generations and sections. If you look back through time, you can see it's really the performance that's going up each time. There are things that are enabling that, like the silicon process, and like packaging that allow you to get more performance out of these different technologies. But we progressed from 20 gig, 28, 30 gigabaud, 100 gig, up to what we are now, which is in the 90 gigabaud plus range. Uh, now, there have been um, efforts, of course, as you go along to take the new technology, the new processes, the new packaging, and move them back into it. So there are, for example, 200 gig pluggables now, uh, and there are some 400 gig pluggables. But generally, the focus has always been on improving performance. Uh, those pluggables never sold in the quantities that the improved performance ones did. And this year, the 2020 columns you see here is when all that changed. We started coming out with the very high pri high performance and the very um, high power efficiency ones at the same time. 
Uh, now, there is something going on beyond that. There is the 1 terabit, 1.2, 1.6, whatever that happens to be coming up later. Uh, those we'll probably see at OFC this year, a couple of announcements. There's been some pre-announcements that have already come out about what's going to happen there. And then what's going to happen beyond that is really up in the air. Where we're starting to lose uh, spectral efficiency, where, where really the only thing you're getting now is the reduction in the number of lasers. Um, and that's going to be a really interesting question to start asking around things like OFC, what happens beyond this next generation. All right, next slide. Um, I'll wait for it to come up. This is just talking about those performance, those power optimized pluggable coherent optics. And if you look at what's happening, they're entirely focused on 400 gig, which happens to be the title of this talk, so that works out pretty well. Uh, the table, table on the left is our compilation of everything that's happening with pluggable coherent optics. And almost everything on that table is based on 400 gig. <clears throat> now, the one that gets the most press is 400 ZR. That was the OIF standard entirely for short reach data center interconnect, 80 to 100, 120 kilometers entirely de decided, supposed to be in a uh, small form factor, QSFPDD. There's one, uh, one guy out there who wants, one operator who wants OSFPs, but generally it's pluggable into the switches and routers, eliminating the transport layer in between, um, nothing fancy in between, no rotoms, just a simple amplifier, short reach interconnect. And what the DSP uh, vendor said was, well, if we're going to build this, why don't we go ahead and build in some extra capabilities so that we can reach a larger market? And that, in general, is considered 400ZR+. Plus. And there are lots and lots of things that are considered 400ZR+. Plus. There's industry coalitions like OpenZR+, Plus and Open Rotom. Uh, and then there's some proprietary things. There's some subcarrier things. There's all sorts of other stuff going on. Now, the ZR+, Plus and the Open Rotom ones are the ones that are getting a lot of noise because, of course, they are done by more than, more than one person. Um, ZR Plus was really for data center interconnect but going over longer distances. And the way they do that, there are some that are still QSFP DD, uh, but the power requirements become too big and a lot of them expand out into a CFP2. Um, Open Rotom certainly is going to be a CFP2. That's more of a telecom carrier. It's got uh, OTN framing in it that needs those bigger packages to be able to go to, to more power consumption. Uh, there's also some 100 gig that's going on. We mentioned 100 ZR here. That's almost entirely dependent on price. What can you do uh, with 100 gig coherent that you can't do with 100 gig non-coherent for a similar price? Uh, it'll probably start out with enterprise where they're a little bit less cost sensitive, but the goal is to eventually move that into the access and take out the 10 gig WDM that right now is proliferating in things like the cable networks. So this whole idea is that these were designed to be around 400 gig networks, designed on the idea that 400 gig is going to be the coin of the realm. It's going to be the, the main thing that we use going forward. Uh, the current status right now, 400 ZR is supply limited. They are making as many as they can. They are all being consumed as fast as they can by operators uh, and by network, by network equipment vendors who are trying to get these evaluated and out into the networks. Um, what we've been told by the people who are, who are deploying these is that the technology and pricing is meeting the expectations. The power may be a little bit high. It's not quite 15. Maybe it's 17. Maybe it's 20, but it's pretty close. It is being able to be deployed. Uh, the DD, if you look at our forecast, that's going to be most of the volume, the QSFP DD. And that's because 400ZR by the cloud guys is going to be massive. They're going to buy lots and lots and lots of those. Uh, IP over DWDM web scale. Some of them are going to be able to get Q, um, OpenZR Plus performance in DD eventually, and maybe not in the first generation, but certainly soon. And so that's going to be the, the bulk of just the numbers. But if you're not a cloud provider, you're not a web scale, CFP2 actually is pretty attractive. And there's going to be, that's, that's popular with um, a, a variety of service providers. Windstream came out with some press releases recently on that. China is very focused on CFP2. So that's going to be a big market right below the 400ZR. All right, next slide, let's talk about the performance optics. High performance optics, people like, tend to focus on the top speed. Can it go 800 gigabits per second? Can it go one terabit per second? Can it go 600 gigabit per second? Largely, that top speed is completely irrelevant. Um, this is a, a chart on the right. Is our, we've been capturing all of the announcements that have been made publicly, not privately, but publicly, about speed versus distance for all of the new stuff coming out. And the blue dots are the brand new latest generation. And there's this big cluster around 800 gig, but those are almost all hero experiments, just seeing what can we do with it. When you look at the actual deployments, they're kind of clustered more around 400 gig. And that's where the previous generation, which is in red, was focused. That's also where the pluggable, which is in green, is focused. Uh, that's really sort of the sweet spot, carrying 400 gig. Most commercial deployments are a little bit closer to that. 
Um, the baud rate is what matters, not the top speed. So I know financial analysts in particular get stuck on this idea of 800 versus 600 versus 400. The reality is most of it is about transporting 400 gig, and can you do it the most efficient way in the most cost-effective way? Um, so it's interesting to note that when I mentioned, you know, sometimes you take what the latest generation is and you, re you go back and look at the previous generation and make it a little bit better. That's essentially what's happening with 400ZR. If you look at the previous generation of 400 gig, what the pluggables can do now is comparable to what the previous generation of embedded could do. Um, there are new solutions coming out that will get up to 1.2 terabit, but even those are really focused on multiple 400 gigs. Um, 800 gig is a, is a lot further out, so we're talking about two times, two times 400 over 800. So don't get lost in the top speeds. It really still is a 400 gig world, at least for the next, um, next few years. All right, next slide. And if you look at our forecast, there is this belief um, or this, this sort of rumor or, or maybe it's just a, a lot of people talking to themselves and, and convincing themselves that, that when this pluggable stuff comes out, the embedded stuff is going to go away. And that's not really going to happen. The graph on the right is just 400 gig and above. If we included 100 gig and 200 gig in there, obviously the pluggables are much more popular than 100 gig and 200 gig now. But if you look at 400 gig and above, the pluggables coming out, the IP over WDM, the new things that are coming out, that's a brand new market. It's not necessarily taking what exists and cannibalizing from it. There is still going to be a huge demand for long haul and for subsea and for those embedded coherent uh, plugs, uh, embedded coherent uh, modules that, that allow that to happen. This new market is coming in behind it and allowing things like IP over WDM that didn't exist before. So both of these are going to be growing long term. It's not like they're going to completely... Um, compete against each other in every market. Now, there will be some competition in some markets, and that's what we talk about in the next slide. Um, this is the, <clears throat> this slide and the next one will talk about how exactly these things are transitioning over time and where they're being used. It's kind of a lot to look at on the right, but essentially what this is showing is slices of what percentage of the market is specific types of coherent. Uh, and what you'll see is anything below 400 gig as we get into 2020, 2021, that's all starting to disappear. 100 gig performance optics are going away. There are some 100 gig pluggables showing up at the edge when you get up to 24 and 25, but that's not a big part of the market. 200 gig is going away. That really depends on China. China loves 200 gig. They've got a ton of it deployed. If they decide to get rid of it, it goes away completely. Um, embedded optic top speeds are continuing to increase, so you're going to continue to see uh, the 400 uh, gig plus stuff in there. That's the yellow. is going to continue uh, to grow for those specific markets, but operators are going to have to start making decisions. They now have more options than they used to have. Where am I going to use the embedded optics with the absolute best performance versus going with the pluggable? And the ZRs, that's the pluggables, there's essentially three markets. There's the data center interconnect, that's 400 ZR. That's going to ramp very, very quickly. Uh, 400 ZR is the green there. You can see it goes from nothing to being a, a measurable percentage within about a year, and that's because of the web scale guys. The edge, the 100 ZR, it's entirely up to the price. And until we see more of those come out into the market and see what the price and performance looks like, it's hard to predict those. So that's a small part of the market right now. All that stuff in the middle, that Metro and Long Haul 400 ZR Plus, it's all coming down to, do you want to use this versus a, a high performance? It comes down to cost. It comes down to what your network looks like. Uh, and that's the next slide where I talk about these decisions where you're having to make the choice, um, which one of these are you going to use? If you are, the to if you are a customer in the top line, where you just have point-to-point, -point, simple system, just amplifiers, nothing but routers. The lowest cost option is taking a ZR or a ZR Plus QSF PDD, plug it into your router, great connection, easy, no choice, no other options there. That's the best way to go. If you are the bottom line and you're going for the absolute highest performance, you've got a sub-C, you've got a very long haul, you need the absolute best spectral efficiency, then you're going to have to put an optical system in there and put in the best possible embedded optics. Where the trade-off is, is that somewhere in the middle. You've got a couple of rotums. You've got a line system that's a little bit more complicated, slightly longer distance. Um, do you want to put an embedded optical in there and get the best performance, or do you want to put in pluggable? And I think Jonathan's going to talk more about what the economics are for making that choice uh, when you're in that middle one where we have the question mark. That's really where the big debate is going to be. On the next slide, we talk a little bit more about what does that mean when you get to 2025. And this is our sort of forecast for 2025, and it's a little squishy. But basically, at the Metro Edge, um, the ZRs, the pluggables, and the ZR Plus pluggables kind of start to merge where the 400 ZR and maybe 800 ZR, if that comes out in time, that's really just point to point. The rest of the market is pluggable 
incumbents, MSOs, enterprise, um, and the performance, the high performance stuff is a very small sliver, if anything. And that really comes down to economics. And like we said, that distinction between ZR and ZR Plus could go away, especially with the next generation of DSPs, uh, when you get to smaller uh, feature size, and you can actually put more power into a smaller device. On the long haul, the one on the bottom, that's a little easier to see as well. Mostly performance, high performance, 600 gig, 800 gig, 1.2 terabit, all of that stuff. Highest capacity, highest uh, spectral efficiency, highest cost per bit, uh, lowest cost per bit per kilometer, best performance you can get. Absolutely, those embedded optics are going to be the way to go. But there will be a small part of the market that wants to go with pluggable. They want IP over WDM. They like the idea of having multiple sources. Um, and some of the pluggables are have pretty good performance. We're talking about several thousand kilometers. So um, there's going to be a small part of the market that's there. The big debate is that bit in the middle, and the arrows essentially could go in both directions. Are the, is there going to be more disaggregation, more IP over WDM, which means all pluggables? People are going to, are people going to be more at the high performance, the better spectral efficiency? Is that cost going to come down? That's really where the battle is, and that's more what Jonathan's going to talk about uh, with Ribbon's point of view in there, in that section in the middle. What exactly is are each of these customers going to choose, and why? what are the decisions they have to make in that section in the middle? All right, I believe that's my last slide, other than the thank you slide at the end there. Hey, Jonathan, okay. before before we uh, pass it over, I just want to remind everybody who's on the webinar, again, thanks for attending. But please feel free to ask your questions below at the bottom right, and we do have those uh, takeaways or those downloads for you, too. So uh, take a look at those at your convenience. Thanks. Well, thank you, Scott, and uh, thank you uh, for Lance. Again, uh, like Lance says, uh, now that Scott's uh, stopped talking and after delivering his uh, I'd say uh, nice, concise, and deep insights into the marketplace. He'll have a good chance to review questions that you could be asking him. So I'm going to go a little bit de more deeply now into uh, Ribbon's uh, point of view on this technology and how we plan to use it and what we see as some potentially uh, market disrupting factors that come from this technology. So one of the things that we see today uh, that characterize the marketplace, uh, a lot of the headlines that we see have to do with transmission transmission speeds, uh, 400G, 600G, 800G, and what might come beyond that. Uh, what I'd like to remind people on this call is this is impressive and it's important as the technology advances, but what's really most important is uh, what is the mission uh, for these transmission technologies. And the mission clearly today is for 100 gigabit Ethernet uh, transport and moving ahead tomorrow for 400 gigabit Ethernet transport. And they have to do this for a variety of applications. It has to go through aggregation networks, metro networks, long haul networks, and for varying levels of traffic density uh, for these applications. So what I'm suggesting uh, to the audience over here, what's really important as we're considering our transmission plans going forward is how do we create a standard, if you like, or an approach around 400G transmission, because that will become the future building block, and it could, of course, apply to 100 gigabit Ethernet clients today. And how do we do this for the whole range of applications uh, that it needs to apply to? So here are the building blocks. Again, uh, Scott introduced many of these building blocks. I'll do it in a slightly uh, different kind of way in terms of how we can piece together 400G solutions. So on the left are the current class of uh, solutions. Uh, this was developed uh, starting you know, several years ago using 60 nanometer and more recently 7 nanometer technologies. Uh, these are embedded modules. What embedded modules means is when you build a line card with these technologies, you have to mount it within the line card itself. It becomes a fixed part of the line card. And these solutions are vendor proprietary. In other words, they're coming out uh, only specific to a specific vendor, and these cannot interwork with the solutions from another vendor. You know, you might have two vendors doing 800G, but they cannot interwork with each other. Uh, they tend to be higher power because they're not constrained by a particular size, and, and they're very sophisticated in terms of providing optimum performance for a maximum spectral efficiency. Today, there's really two classes of solution, 2 times 600G or an 800G solution. And they're oriented towards transport networks with sophisticated CD, CDC rodents. The two kinds of pluggables that have been introduced uh, are coming out now as the result of standards activities, uh, such as the uh, Open uh, Rotom MSA and uh, Open ZR Plus uh, type of MSA activities. And there's really two classes of solution. Uh, there's a small form factor like the QSFPDD and the lesser used uh, OSFP solutions. 
and I will not be focusing on these today. Uh, they are important, and we'll start to see a lot of the application for these in uh, IP over DWDM type of applications. Uh, but they tend to be uh, smaller, power constrained. Uh, they only uh, launch uh, with uh, minus 10 dBm. And uh, again, like I said, they will have their application space, but they're not going to be the focus today. Uh, the focus today uh, is going to be on what is the CFP2 DCO module. Uh, this is a larger pluggable. Uh, it's based on the same 7 nanometer technology as the embedded uh, modules. And you might ask, uh, well, I'll get a little bit into that, why it's sort of coming out a little bit later. Um, but it uh, can compete in the same application space. Uh, again, it has a signal launch power of 0 dBm or 1 milliwatt, and it could also apply over CD, CDC, uh, RODEM networks. One of the important factors that I'm bringing out over here, and you don't usually see this uh, in this kind of presentation, uh, but I am going to raise this subject here, and that's relative cost. Um, cost, of course, is a tricky thing because uh, suppliers can play different uh, games with cost. You can cut your margins if you want, or you can bundle it with other, other types of pricing. But ultimately, cost does weigh. Uh, because there's uh, certain kinds of technologies that go into the solution. And uh, so it, it's, it, it's a mitigating factor to a, to, a, to, a, to a fairly large extent. And you have to ask yourself, why is the CFP to DCO going to be less costly than the embedded modules if they're competing in a similar space? And the answer is, A, because it's simpler. It's not trying to be the same level of achievement as uh, sort of maximizing uh, spectral efficiency. And the other reason is, as you can see, there's going to be many suppliers for this technology. Uh, I, I've listed some of the underlying DSP vendors and some of the main transceiver vendors. This is all public information. And as a result of all these suppliers, what we'll see is a price competition, which will also help to bring the pricing down for these types of modules. So how do we compare these solutions? So if we look at the bottom, and here I've uh, really liked uh, Scott's uh, diagram in, in terms of preparing these transport options, so I made my own version of this. Uh, thank you very much, Scott. So what we see at the bottom is the solution for 400G that was available until now. This was only available using the embedded solutions because until recently, these were the only solutions available on the market. And, and these provide solutions for optimized uh, performance and maximum spectral efficiency. As a result of these new pluggable technologies, what we'll see are the two other kinds of solutions uh, that Scott mentioned. So the one at the top, again, is using the small form factor pluggables. Here I've highlighted the QSFPDD, uh, which can provide transmission at 400G. And again, this is very uh, attractive for point-to-point -point connections or for simple RODEM networks. And again, it has to be limited to simple RODEM networks because of the fact there's limited launch power. On the other hand, uh, when we're looking at the CFP2 DCO implementing the 400 GZR plus technologies, that can compete against the embedded solutions. So a lot of what I'm going to be focusing on in this presentation is how these solutions can compare to each other in terms of accomplishing the various missions for 100 gigabit Ethernet and 400 gigabit Ethernet transport. So to appreciate this a little bit more and put a little bit more perspective on this, uh, let's take a little bit of a visual look at the rollout of these technologies. So as I mentioned, the first technologies to come to the market, or most recently, were the embedded modules. Uh, starting in late 2019, uh, the first versions of these came about. This was based on 600 uh, G technologies. Um, this was based on 60 nanometer DSPs. It provided 600 G wavelengths. And the, there is a relationship, if you like, um, between the DSP technologies and the baud rates uh, that are available with these technologies. So this was based on a 70 gigabaud technology. If you put two of these 600 G wavelengths together, it occupied a spectrum of 150 gigahertz. Uh, last year, there were several vendors that came out with uh, technologies based on 7 nanometer DSP technology. And this was based on 800G wavelengths, which was achieved using 95 gigabaud. The spectral uh, or the channel width that's required for that and what they're using is 112.5 gigahertz. Uh, there is a direct relationship between the baud rate, which is the symbol rate, and the amount of spectrum that is needed uh, for, to, for that particular uh, symbol rate. 
What came out next using the same 7 nanometer technology uh, was, was these implementations uh, for 400 GZR. Now this, because it's in a smaller form factor, it does not have as much power that can be used towards the solution, came out at a lower baud rate. So again, as Scott pointed out, the optimization here was for power and cost efficiency and for a, in a smaller package. So it's based on a similar uh, DSP technology, but they're optimizing on different factors. In this particular case, they're optimizing on size and on power. So in a particular module, you cannot achieve 800G, you can only achieve a single 400G. But, and as I will discuss in the presentation, depending on how you use this technology in terms of the mission of transporting 100 gigabit and 400 gigabit Ethernet traffic, it can achieve what we believe is superior cost performance. Looking ahead to where embedded solutions are going in the future, in the upper right, uh, there's already work underway towards creating uh, solutions based on 5 nanometer technology. Uh, what this will do is enable pushing the baud rate up to 130 gigabaud. Uh, this will require a channel width of 150 gigahertz, uh, but it will have certain benefits in terms of the current generation of embedded solutions, and I'll talk a little bit about this later. So what I'm going to talk about now is how Ribbon is implementing the CFP2 DCO technology in a product that we call the Apollo TM400-2. So here is an overview of this card, and actually uh, we are releasing this card next month. Uh, we believe we are first to market using the CFP2 DCO technology. It will be formally announced at OFC. Uh, what you can see is it uses two CFP2 DCO pluggables. Uh, each of these pluggables can be configured or programmed to operate at 100G, 200G, 300G or 400G, depending on the distance to be transmitted and the line conditions. And moreover, it has a very unique design uh, with an internal switch. And what this internal switch means is that each of these CFP2 DCOs can be used either independent mode or they can be used in a tandem mode. And the table at the bottom shows the various combinations of how this can be used for transporting uh, 100 gigabit Ethernet client traffic or 400 gigabit Ethernet client traffic. By the way, I want to point out, because it's a pluggable, uh, we will be using both standard versions of this pluggable as well as proprietary versions of this pluggable. So standard versions means that they will interwork with those that are based on a similar on the same standard from another vendor. Proprietary versions means uh, that we're taking a an option, or actually they can often be the same pluggable just configured in different modes, but you can get a little bit more performance out of it by using it in a proprietary way. What I want to draw your attention to is the bottom row on the 400 gigabit Ethernet. So there you see uh, first the independent mode where you have client A and client B, two 400 gigabit Ethernet clients, and these can now be configured to transmit over two separate lines, it could be in two separate directions, over two separate fibers for DCI or for metro distances. On the other hand, uh, if you want to transmit over long haul distances, by using the internal switch, what we're able to do is sort of downspeed the lines. So by doing that, uh, we can increase the uh, efficiency of, of the transmission. And what we can do is we can now combine two 200G lines for effective 400G rate for 400 gigabit Ethernet transport in a long haul application. And this makes it a very formidable and very flexible card that can be used in multiple applications. But I've made a claim that we can do better than existing technologies, and I'm now going to go into that. So here's a little bit of why. And to understand why the CFP2 DCO can compare and actually exceed performance uh, than current uh, solutions, we really need to understand uh, some aspects of modulation. So what I'm saying here, just to start the argument, is by saying if I have two solutions, call it transceiver one and transceiver two, and they're both operating at the same line rate over the same type of fiber condition, in other words, in the same kind of amplification, etc., the solution that will use less dense modulation will always go further. 
So for instance, in the example, I'm showing 400G using 8 qualm, which is 3 bits per symbol, versus 400G using 16 qualm, which is 4 bits per symbol. The modulation that has a less dense modulation will always go further. And, and the way I like to think of this intuitively is if you ever looked at these kind of eye diagrams in terms of all the symbols and all the uh, points that make up the symbol, what you need to be able to do is to be able to distinguish, this, distinguish these at the receiver. The denser they are, or the more bits per symbol, the harder it is to distinguish this at the receiver because the bits get smeared along the way, uh, to use a technical word. So by having things less dense, fewer bits per symbol, you're able to go further. So how do we determine what modulation is required? Well, we can start off by looking at the line rate. So the line rate is just the simple math. It's the baud rate, or symbols per second, times the modulation, which is bits per symbol, times two polarizations, times some overhead that you need to take into account for uh, forward error correction. When you turn this equation around, you understand what modulation can be achieved. So the varying factor here is, in fact, the baud rate. So how does this look now? when we're sort of comparing the two types of solutions. So again, I've repeated the equation at the top if you ever want to do the math for yourself. And if we start off by looking at the CFP2 DCO solution, the GM400-2, if we're transmitting at 400G uh, at 64 gigabaud, and I've assumed, by the way, 80% uh, overhead, or it's really 20%, but you have to divide by 80% uh, for the math, what it ends up with for metro distances is a modulation of 3.9 bits per symbol, which you'll probably round up to 4 bits per symbol. When you're looking at an embedded solution, here they're transmitting at 800G. Uh, you have the advantage of 95 gigabaud symbol rate, but it ends up being that you require 5.3 bits per symbol because you're going at twice the rate. So what you need to compare now is how does two CFP2 DCOs compare against a single embedded 800G. And the same type of approach uh, works on the long haul side. So on the long haul side, for the embedded solution, what we're looking at is a transmission rate of 400G, and this requires 2.6 bits per symbol. On the other hand, when we're looking at the solution with CFP2 DCO, what we can do is 2 times 200G where each one only requires 1.9 bits per symbol, which in fact is just under a QPSK type of modulation. And what this enables us to do by combining two of these two DC, uh, CFP2 DCO solutions is actually achieve further transmission distance uh, than we can achieve with a single embedded solution. So this puts it all together uh, in terms of the comparison. So we see what happens uh, for metro transport distances. Uh, on the upper right. So here we have two 400 Gs, and as I've showed in the previous slide, this uh, can go further. In fact, it can go, uh, based on the math, which, which I'm not getting into here, it can actually go twice the distance of an embedded 800 G solution for the same fiber conditions. To complete the equation, though, you really need to compare cost. And the claim that I've made is that the cost of the CFP2 DCOs, from what we've seen in the marketplace and what we see based on the underlying technologies, is half the cost of the embedded solutions. Uh, and the same thing, by the way, holds true on the long haul types of solutions. So here, by combining two 200G wavelengths, we can go further for the same or less cost than you can uh, at 400G with an embedded, embedded 800G. So as a result of this, what we're saying is, and I don't think this has really hit home yet with the marketplace, and, and this is really the point that we're trying to make over here, is that this is really a revolutionary technology, uh, this CFP2 DCO, because it does really have the potential to upset the apple cart, so to speak, in terms of the dominancy until now of the embedded technologies. To complete the picture, uh, just to be totally fair in terms of all the evaluation factors, uh, the embedded 800G solution does have better spectral efficiency. Here we're talking about 112.5 gigahertz versus 150 gigahertz using uh, two uh, CFP DCO wavelengths. Uh, but for most applications, I would maintain that the cost per bit is much more important than spectral efficiency. There's usually more than enough spectrum, uh, at least initially, on most fibers. The other thing is that it's also more power efficient. So 
this is the kind of picture uh, to have in mind when you're comparing these kinds of solutions. Uh, th and this is what we see as our proposition to the marketplace. That's only, uh, again, part of the story. I, I did start to talk about spectrum, and there are aspects of spectrum I'd like to emphasize a little bit more over here. And that is one whereby, even though you may not be concerned about spectrum in the short term, I think in the long term, spectrum is important, particularly as you move from various kinds of solutions. One of the strong points about optical transmission today <clears throat> is that we have flexible spectrum, or flex grid, uh, that all new generations of Rotom support, which means that you're not limited or constrained in the spectral width of the solution. It doesn't have to be 50 gigahertz or 100 gigahertz like it was in the past. And in fact, that we see embedded solutions at 800G using this fairly odd number of 112.5 gigahertz. That's totally acceptable from a transmission point of view. However, it sort of begs the question, what happens to that 112.5 gigahertz slot as you move to new generations of technology as they become available? Because this has to go between many links and different links might be using uh, the spectrum in slightly different ways, it's going to be very hard, if you like, to clean up the spectrum once it's allocated in one place and then make that available, say, on another fiber link for some other kind of transmission scheme. And what this can lead towards is a lot of wasted or abandoned spectrum because of this odd kind of channel width that it's using. What we maintain is that there's an opportunity using the CFP2 DCO technology to standardize on a 75 gigahertz channel width. Uh, this can be used for single channel or single wavelength 400G transmission. And also, as we've shown, it could also be combined by using 2 times 200G wavelengths for long haul uh, by putting these together into 150 gigahertz channel. The other point to make is that when we're taking a look at the next generation of embedded technologies at 5 nanometers, uh, this will also uh, be based on 130 gigabaud technology that uh, will also use 150 gigahertz. So by applying the DCO technologies or the CFP2 DCO technologies today, it's also enabling uh, you to be future-proof uh, for the next generation of embedded technologies. So the question now becomes, why should I think about the next generation of embedded technologies? Well, it has two advantages. One is it does give you a single 1200G wavelength that could be used in short haul or DCI applications which means that you can put 12 100 gigabit Ethernet or three 400 gigabit Ethernet uh, clients on that particular wavelength. Also, it will support a 400G wavelength with true QPSK modulation, which maximizes its potential for long haul. So, in summary, uh, what we see is some in tremendous uh, potential uh, from these new technologies, uh, from the CFP2 DCO. Uh, it gives us the opportunity to start today to build an optical highway based on what we call N times 400 G speeds uh, on M times 75 gigahertz channel widths, or you can call those the lanes. We can achieve those today uh, with our CFP2 DCO pluggable solution in the TM400-2. This provides single channel 400G for Metro, dual channel for long haul. And in late 2022, we'll be able to add to this with a 130 gigabaud solution, which will provide single wavelength uh, 1.2 terabit and single wavelength 400G long haul using uh, QPSK for true long haul capabilities. And the uh, bottom line and the really good news based on the approach that we're taking is that you don't have to go out and sort of take your whole network and convert it to a ribbon Apollo network. Uh, we've adopted a very open approach to the marketplace, uh, both in terms of our Apollo network as an open optical line system, but also if you want to deploy our transmission technology over an existing network. So what you can do is deploy the TM400-2 as uh, alien wavelengths over an existing network. We support open interfaces, specifically we support open config interfaces on our products that they can now be uh, controlled through your existing network controller. So you can start gaining the benefits of this solution today. And um, we hope to be interacting with uh, you in the marketplace on this. And uh, with this slide, 
I will sort of go to the thank you slide and uh, perhaps leave it on this over here and uh, just move over to sort of the discussions and uh, questions phase uh, of this particular uh, discussion. Thanks, Jonathan. Uh, Scott, I think there's a couple questions that came through. Um, if you want to take a look at those, you may want to um, point out a couple of those to the audience that are that are worth responding with. Sure. Um, the first question that came in was, does ZR Plus pluggables go beyond 1,000 kilometers? And that's uh, absolutely true. I think you saw some of those here. A lot of them will be in CFP2s, although I did see at least one spec that said you could take a QSFP DD to about 1,400 kilometers, but you got to have it in a special slot because the power is going to be a little high. So yeah, ZF, ZR Plus will definitely go beyond 1,000 kilometers. Mm -hmm. um, and the other one is, in what respect do you see the line between ZR and ZR Plus diminishing in the next generation? The nomenclature delineates reach capabilities. And so when I said those are combining, I didn't necessarily mean that the performance of the two was combining. What I meant was the same DSP is used for both. This, the DSP for 400ZR is the same DSP that's used for 400ZR+. And if the next generation or even the current generation can get performance of a ZR+, plus in a QSFP DD, then the benefits of having just a 400ZR sort of go away. And if you are a large web scale provider and you want to get just a little bit extra performance, you may go to the market and say, I don't want to buy a vanilla ZR if I can get that performance, if I can get ZR plus performance out of a QSFP DD. And at that point, the ZR, as I was saying, that sort of goes away. You have one plug that does both, and that's what would exist going forward. That was the only two questions on there that I saw for me. Right. We had one other. Uh, what, will, what will the impact uh, be of IP over DWDM? Well, well, I can start on that, and I'm sure Scott, uh, pl please chime in. Um, IP over DWDM, it, it's, it's been around for 20 years uh, in terms of people saying, why do we need a separate optical transport layer? Let's just put all the optics directly into the routers and bypass this optical transport layer. And it sort of comes up every five years in terms of uh, being rejuvenated. And uh, I think it's coming up again. I think this time, though, the opportunities for it is much more serious. Um, I think one of the things that has prevented IP over DWDM in the past has been the uh, faceplate density problem that routers have experienced, uh, whereby a lot of the optics were very large and uh, it really took up a lot of that density on the routers which they wanted to use for other purposes and uh, for their clients. Uh, right now, by going to these small form factors uh, like the QSFPDD and uh, OSFP, uh, that problem is eliminated. So I, I think we will start to see much more take of IP over DWDM for a lot of applications. Contrary to a lot of, I think, people's thought, it's not going to transform the market overnight. Um, there, there is still a lot of advantages, both from an organizational point of view, performance point of view, uh, uh, how you lay out your overall network in terms of things like router bypass, how do you cover sort of longer distances to have a separate optical transport layer. And uh, so the impact will be there. And, and I think it's up to solution providers like Ribbon to have both types of solutions available. So we have our router product line, uh, the Neptune product line, and we'll be building those interfaces directly into the Neptune product line. And at the same time for our customers uh, that are still primarily relying on a separate optical transport network, um, we'll start taking advantage of new technologies like the CFP2 DCOs to enhance the capabilities and to lower the cost of the uh, separate optical transport layer. Yeah, I agree with everything Jonathan said there. That it, it is different this time. It has been around. I, I found the first mention of IP over DWDM in a paper in 2000. Um, and notably, it's, as always, it was by Cisco because Cisco always wanted to get you to buy more routers. Um, there there, are, there is, are things that are different this time. The biggest thing, of course, is faceplate. There's also some intelligence now in the, in the devices, so you don't have to have the router understanding the optical network so much as the device understanding it. If you look at our forecast for Metro WDM, traditional hardware, we don't have it declining long term. We do have the growth rate slowing somewhat. So IP over DWDM will somewhat impact uh, Metro WDM hardware sales, but not to the point where it's going to cause it to go away. 
there is just going to be an expansion of the market. IP over DWDM allows new kind of networks to be built that couldn't be built before. Um, data center interconnect models and, and multi-clusters of, of data centers and things like that, that that you just couldn't do in the past because economically it didn't work. So there is going to be certainly an impact from that. Um, and then it'll be interesting to see when the ZRs and ZR pluses, when you get more and more uh, performance out of a QSF PDD because you need the faceplate, how much more of an impact does it have? But that's much further out. Okay. Father, I think Lance, I saw one question. Will this recording be available later? I'm pretty sure the answer is yes. Absolutely, okay. yes. We'll get a, an email out probably later, later this afternoon with a link to the replay. You also have a link to the slides, although they are here for you to take now if you'd like. But um, yeah, we'll get that out later today. And uh, you can watch that anytime. And obviously, you can reply to that email with any additional questions you might have or any things that may pop into your head once we close out today. So um, I think any final thoughts, Jonathan or Scott, before we, we thank everybody and close out today? I, the only thought that I would say is because I've had some sort of side conversations with Scott on this in terms of uh, how the market will play out. And I, I think the only answer is we'll see. Uh, it's, uh, it's interesting how you know, optics, we think we sort of reach a plateau in terms of the technology and then the next sort of good thing comes along and it uh, could change the overall uh, landscape over here. So it's, uh, you know, we can debate it up to a point, but I think it'll be up to the suppliers uh, and the solution suppliers to see how they use this technology. And, uh, you know, it's not just going to be ribbon, it'll be other people as well. And I think the big winners from this whole thing, of course, are the uh, network operators themselves who will be able to continue getting more bandwidth at lower cost, uh, which means that we can continue holding these kinds of webinars at, at essentially zero cost per bit. <laughs> that, that's a good summary. I won't add anything more to that. That's good. Okay, great. Well, thanks, Scott, and thanks, Jonathan, for, for presenting for us today. Appreciate it. Uh, good stuff. So, And thank you to all the attendees for joining us today. Again, be on the lookout for that email um, with the replay and the slides and, and all the documents will be in there as well if you didn't have a chance to download those yet. And of course, uh, visit ribbon.com or signalai.com for more information. You can get a hold of us at any of those locations. We'd love to hear from you. So thanks again, and we hope to chat with you all very soon. Have a great day. Thank you. Thanks.